Yes, we had such an awesome day yesterday. So we're ready to get started this morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up with prayer and set our hearts and minds ready to receive again all that God has for us. Amen. And then I'm going to turn it over to Allison and um, she, we have our public service announcements. And, and then we're, I think we're going to hear from some of y'all this morning. We'd love to hear testimonies, hear some things that God's saying to you, uh, what, what impacted you yesterday. So we're excited to hear from you. But I would like to have um, somebody from our team, maybe Donna. Would you like to open us in prayer this morning? Donna's one of the leaders of our community prayer group. So welcome, Donna. Woo! A true prayer warrior. Right? Not only was I eating, I was talking here. <laughs> Ladies, be blessed. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for these ladies, Lord, who are blessed and who are anointed and who walk in your word, who are prayer warriors, Father. Lord, thank you for your wisdom and guidance to each one. And Lord, I ask that you bless this meeting, this congregation of your people today beyond anything that we've ever seen. Thank you, Lord, for your fire and your anointing and your glory in this room. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Who wants this? Good morning. So glad you made it back. And then there's some new faces. Who was not here yesterday? Oh, we have quite a few people. I know we missed you last night. Oh, so good, so good. Uh, so good to see you. Olga's uh, representing Orlando. Okay, and then we did the counties yesterday. We've got Seminole, we had Orange, Brevard. Brevard, I think that was it. Was there any other counties not represented? Any other counties that we missed? Yeah, we what? what? Yeah. Volusia. Volusia. That's awesome. Well, Pennsylvania. Woohoo! That's great. Well, praise, praise the Lord. I do want to go back. Right. And then the um, the community intercessor leadership team, Brian Click. The, yay! They are prayer warriors of the large county. And is Nancy in the house? Nancy Black? Nancy Black, could you come out, please? So the community intercessors was spun off of a couple of groups. And I want Nancy to just give you a brief history. I want Nancy to give you just a brief history of how the community intercessors started. Nancy's the wisest woman in the room, and well, we can't even argue about that. <laughs> just tell them how the community intercessors came to be, where it started, just briefly. Oh, okay. Well, um, it. I gotta thank myself. <laughs> That's my wisdom. <laughs> no, you want to you want to go back to Heart of the Father? I want to go back before Heart of the Father. Well, that it started from Heart of the Father. Uh, Heart of the Father. It started in my living room. I have uh, six chairs in my living room, and uh, you could add four. So I had. Uh, People that kept wanting to come uh, have a meeting, and I says, "Well, when we get to ten, we will." So when we got to ten, Brenda said, "Well, you're welcome to use our facility." So we went to Brenda's, and uh, in February, I'm sorry, in uh, the fall of 1920. <laughs> that's my wisdom. Uh, in the fall of. Uh, it had to be 2015. Uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to put you back in the ministry when you're 80. And you know all the things I said to the Lord. <laughs> and so, uh, 
but in the meantime, I met Jeremiah Johnson, and um, Helen took me to a meeting with Jeremiah, and um, then we talked back and forth a bit. He sent me a text and said, now remember, we're at Brenda's now, and he sent me a text and said, I want to come and speak to your group February the 19th. He did not know that was my 80th birthday. And that's how it began. And so we went for four years, and uh, Jeremiah came the first year. He came every month. And uh, then the next year, it was every three months, and the next year, it was twice. And then he moved on, and uh, those of you who know him have kept up with his record. Anyway, um, then uh, the Lord said, after four years, a little more, he said, uh, You're this is the end of this season for you, and I'm going to move you on. And I had a prophetic word that said, uh, I see you passing the baton. So I passed the baton to Joyce Christopher And Joyce, uh, under the leadership of the Lord, felt it was right to begin a church with Derek Kelly from Winter Haven coming as the as the pastor. And so they they have a church that meets on Saturday afternoon. And then Brenda and Donna Stubbs felt the Lord was leading them to pick up that part of Heart of the Father, which was the prayer group, and continue to meet on Wednesdays. And the purpose is to really know what's on the Father's heart, especially for Brevard County yeah. and beyond. And that's still the call of community prayer group is what is on the heart of the Father. Yeah. So we thank Brenda and Donna for picking it up and going with it. We thank Joyce for carrying on with another angle. And then I'm left and uh, I know what my next assignment is. I just do not know where and when. <laughs> But you know what? God can call you at any moment, at any time, and God's going to call a lot of us in this in this time. I'm not quite 80 yet, but I'm you know, I'm retired. Okay, I will tell you my age. But, okay, then you can go to the announcements. That's the brochure. Go another time, and we're going to worship in just a few minutes. But we are going to worship, but in a different way. We want to give some get some testimonies. I Keith. I have, I have two testimonies that I want you to hear because they're super awesome that have happened at this conference. Amen. And Keith's not here yet, so if you want to come first, Grayson. Grayson got prayed for by Liberty last night, and before he even got home, he was activated. Hello. Uh, so we have to take US-1 to go back to my parents' house, and uh, I was driving... Uh, through and I was about to pass through downtown Melbourne and I really felt gripped for it and it was it was so random and, and so I didn't know why the Lord was sending me there but I said okay I'll go and I'll, I'll walk around for a bit and we'll see and so I I park and I'm like just praying to the Lord and I'm like asking um, that I just see a familiar face a friend or something like that who needs the love of Jesus and so I get out and I'm by off the tracks I think it is and it's like the first one of the first faces I see was in, was who I thought was an old friend, and I just wasn't quite sure. Got a glimpse of him, kept walking, went around, and, and I mean, it's what Friday, Friday night. Yeah, people are, are out doing crazy stuff, whatever it is, debauchery. Um, and I'm like, Lord, I didn't just come here to be grieved. And so I, I circle back around and I go to my car. I have to get my ID if I'm going to go inside the bar where I saw him playing pool. And I'm like, well, let me make sure that that's him. And so I go inside and. I mean, we lock eyes, and he does a double take with me, and uh, I, I'm just like pointing him out, and I have to go inside, they have to ID me, make sure I'm over 21, uh, and then get security checkpoint, and then just start talking with him. Hey, Greg, how long has it been since you've seen him? Oh, um, I haven't seen him in maybe three or four years. Uh, and so I go inside and I start talking with him, just casual conversation. We have a lot of mutual friends. Um, I knew him from high school. Uh, and I, he asked me why I was coming down here. 
and I told my mom, or I told him that my mom had a women's conference, and he's like, oh, a conference for what? And I was like, uh, for church. And he's like, man, I haven't been to church since my mother died. And when I knew him, his mother died of cancer, and like I was around at that time when him and his little sister were going through that, that very difficult time. And so even that statement really opened up the door for me and um, just kind of kept casually talking while he's playing pool. And then they were about to start another game, and I just pulled him aside really quick, and I said, man, let me speak to you bluntly. I said, I felt unctioned by the Lord to come down here and to share the love of Jesus, and I'm here today. And I was asking for a friend to see, and I'm, I'm standing in front of you just to say that Jesus loves you, he sees you, he knows you, and he's coming back soon. And he's just nodding his head, and he's like, man, I need that. And I said, can I pray for you? He's like, yeah. So I prayed for him, and he's like, gosh, man, I needed that a lot. Um, I've been going through a hard time. Uh, and so I was like, hey, can we get lunch tomorrow, meaning today? And he said, yeah, I'd like that. And so on the way home, I was driving, and he said, Melbourne it would be best to get lunch, and I know God has been calling me back, and that was just such a sign. So God leaves the 99 to go after that one. Amen. Amen. So we release Grayson to go to do that. Let me get specific. Um, so when I when I was getting prayed for Trinity, I do a lot of outreach for my school, uh, Jesus School, and I've been going to UCF. So when she was praying for me, I was like, I just want to be activated for uh, greater outreach, whatever that looks like, you know, gifts, signs, wonders, boldness, whatever that is. And I'd say this is the first time that, like, I really felt this unction and um, a boldness to go and, and preach the gospel to a friend and share the love of Jesus by myself, downtown Melbourne, in the middle of chaos, you know, whatever it is, and I just really felt like it was an activation for me. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, William. I want to introduce Keith Williams. He's our apostolic leader of our group and a wonderful teacher of the Word of God, and he's our friend for over 30 years. I'm going to turn over. He had a, a miracle. Where's Tracy? Yeah. He had a miracle that just brought a blessing to both Tracy and Keith. Her and her husband also. Yeah. Well, just to be briefly, I don't want to take a lot of time Oh, yes, you do. No. <laughs> you have to give a mic to a preacher. But anyway, uh, we went to lunch yesterday, and um, we had a good time at lunch. And as we were getting into the vehicle, I was uh, getting into the rear, the left rear behind Tracy, because she was driving. And as I was getting in, I had one foot in, and I was getting ready to step in. Well, Tracy didn't know that I was still out of the car. So she put it in drive, and the car started to move. And I felt the, the, the tire catch my, my foot. And I thought, uh-oh. And so I knew to try to move out of the car to go perpendicular to the car to get from underneath the wheel. Well, didn't get that far. And the tire ran over my, that uh, Achilles heel of my foot. So I was pinned and started hurting pretty good. And she didn't know it. And then I said, you know, back the car up, back the car up. There was a little bit of confusion, and then she backed the car up. Well, praise God, and there was, I didn't hear anything pop, didn't hear anything break or snap. I thought, okay, I'm okay. So as I laid there, I said, all right, let me just stop for a minute. So I stopped for a minute. I thought, okay, let me get up. They took the shoe off. They took the sock off. Yeah, everything kind of looked okay. I thought, oh, everything's fine. So I get up, and I can't walk on it. I thought, okay. And then the pain's pretty bad. I thought, all right. So we get here. Um, we pulled into the back. And I was trying to get out of the... I had gotten uh, out of the vehicle. And Allison came out. She prayed for me. And then she had to come back in to finish serving. So the whole time I'm like, okay, Lord. I'm healed and healed in Jesus' name. But the pain's just... So I thought, no, I'm okay. So I get up and just about collapsed. All right, this still hurts. So we get in the truck and come around to the side where her husband was and 
I'm not exactly sure where he is on those kind of things, but I can tell you what, he had a front row of what God did. It was a front row seat. So he's assisting me, and then another gentleman, Dave, came up and says, hey, let's pray, let's pray. Okay, let's pray again. So I never, you know, you never turn down prayer. When somebody wants to join their faith to yours, praise God. So I said, okay, pray. So he prayed, laid hands on it. And I, by the witness of the Spirit, I, I could hear the Lord saying, you need to do something. All right, so at right about that time, Dave says, do something. Okay, well, I got it. So I, I got on my foot, and I just started to walk on it. And the more I walked, the pain diminished, diminished, and then it was gone. So you walk around. Well, Tracy's husband was standing there, and he looked at me like, you sure you don't want to sit down? I said, what am I sitting down for? I'm healed. And he had that look on his face like, I don't think I just saw that. <laughs> and so I kept walking around, and he just kept looking at me like, um, you, you sure you okay? <laughs> I said, no, I put my sock on, put my shoe on, and I'm here to serve you ladies. So I said, well, time to serve. <laughs> and so that's when he said, are you sure you don't want to? No, I don't. I said, I'm healed. Why, why if, if I'm healed, why am I going to go sit down and put ice on it? Amen. Wouldn't that be counter to what you say your faith is? Especially after the manifestation. So I just want to give the glory to the Lord Jesus. That he's the one that did it. I want to say to you, one of the things that hit my spirit right away was to confirm you that you don't take on that, I did this. It was an accident. And I kept telling her, no, you don't go there. Don't go there. When things happen, they happen. But we serve a God who is greater than anything that ever happens to us. Amen? Amen. For the glory of God, right? Why, why did this? Uh, why did this happen? What, what was it? His father? Was it his mother? Why is he crippled? It's to give God all the glory. It's to glorify the Father. Amen. Amen. I have to add. So Allison came and told us about it, and and we're sitting here, and Grayson did too. And we had started praising worship at some point there for some reason. A few minutes later, and I looked over and I said, Keith's over there dancing. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't just you know, he was dancing over there. And I told Grace, and I said, Keith is dancing. He said, where? Where? <laughs> yeah, because he had to be almost carried in. So praise God for that. Okay, I want I want a couple of other testimonies, things that happened in the meeting, what God is, how God has impacted you already. Anybody would like to? Well, I just want to give the... You have a good one. Yeah, because it was... I, well, first of all, I was stretching in my living room last night, and I finished around 5.50 p.m. So I thought, well, maybe I should go to Eventbrite and start working on that, you know, event. So I see the women's conference, and I'm like, what? Pastor Liberty is in Cocoa Village? I can't believe this. I've been following her... Um, I did the intercessor training in Intercession City, and, uh, you know, of course, miracles, you know, happening in my life, and I'm thinking, I need to, I need to go, and I'm like, okay, well, so, you know, how much time does it take to travel there, and I think it was like 18 minutes or something, like, okay, so I've got, like, basically 12 minutes, so uh, I go upstairs, put on a dress, you know, and shoes, and I, I hop in my car, and I'm here, and um, they said registration is closed. I said, I know. Of course, I serve a God who opens doors. Um, they were so nice with me at the table, but they said, but, but you know, we don't have a seat. 
And I said, yeah, well, I serve a God who opens, who has seats, you know. But I, I said, just said this to myself, you know, I, I'm here. And they said, well, wait a minute, let me talk with Stephanie. And they had one seat, I think Clarice couldn't be here. And they said, this is a gift from Spirit. I said, I know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know the seat is a gift from Spirit. She said, oh, you don't know. You're at table, the table with liberty. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Praise God. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise, Praise God. God. So that's my purpose. God loves his kids. God loves his kids. Yeah, so mama. Excuse me, Apron, I'm making your lunch right now. Thank you for serving. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome. This is Samantha. Hello, everyone. So yesterday, after Robin spoke, I went up for a prayer. And no one was quite going up, and I just went up and I said, I'm missing out on my blessing. I'm showing up on the altar. And we always have to do that, right? Don't be afraid. Just show up for prayer. So she started praying over me, and I've been feeling something like in my middle. And during my prayer, I'm like, Lord, what is that? Take it out. What is it? I don't want it there. It's blocking something between us. And I still don't know what it is. But sure enough, that's the first thing she did. She said, you have a block right here. And she kept pulling and pulling. And then finally she just went, what? And after that, total freedom. And there was a noose around my neck that was generational. I don't know what that was. Sometimes we don't have to know what it is. Right? We don't have to know. And there was a boulder on my back that she took off. And there were other things she spoke. You know, there are always other things. Increased anointing. He's stirring up the wells. He's stirring up the waters. And I knew all those things were coming. But I guess my whole point of this testimony is that he knows. He knows what you need to be delivered of. He's not ashamed of what you need to be delivered of. We have a healing and deliverance ministry. I'm telling you, we see people set free all the time. Oh, and lose it here. He's so beautiful. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to come and get deliverance. We don't need deliverance because there's generational stuff. Maybe you haven't sinned in your own life. I know that's not real, but, but I mean, you know, maybe you haven't sinned very much, but I bet you our ancestors did. I bet they did. We carry things that we haven't done that we just need to be free from. And if you don't, you know, even if you don't want to come to for like formal deliverance, just come to him. Get on your knees. He is our deliverer. Amen. He's our healer. Amen. Praise God. We're going to do one song. Laura. Oh, Laura. Yeah, we have got to get time for Laura because she's the sweetheart of our group. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I was on my way to the conference yesterday in the afternoon. Get everything ready. And I was just so grateful we had a conference. It's in our area. And thank you, Lord. And just worshiping Him. And, and I was at the stoplight. The stoplight turned green. Okay, my turn to go. I always, except for this time, always, always, always try to look both ways before I go. Well, I did this time. It was green. Look, everybody looked like they were. I pull out, and there's a car coming, a truck. And he's, like, so close to my car when I pulled out. There was no way but God that I got out of that without even being hit. I could have been T-boned, and it was obviously my sign. And he was coming the speed limit through the intersection. And I got through that, and the Lord's like, you know, I, you know, nothing's going to happen to you. You know, I am with you. You know, I am covering you. And, you know, nothing's going to, I have got plans for you. You know, so so we know that we don't have to worry about anything. And it was like the Lord didn't allow me to have fear about that afterwards. You know, you can be kind of shaken up about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, thank you, Lord. You know, I don't have any fear that, you know. And so I'm just so grateful. And, um. I just can't say that, but I have that song of um, my beloved one, you know, and it's just, um, he is so beautiful, you know, he's so wonderful, and so, 
you know, we forget to say thank you sometimes. And so I just praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're all here. So I want to real quick share. I was wrestling with God because I want to hear from you all. I don't want you to hear from me, but God healed my back. And shame on me because we need to give honor and glory to him. And I want to encourage you. God's here. He is doing things. So if there is a miracle, something you need in your life, reach out because he's doing things. Um, Thursday, we were all here, and we did a lot of moving boxes and you know, carrying things in to get set up. And I suffered a, 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 a catastrophic back injury last year that I've been in recovery for. And so I was lifting things, and you know how we are. And I was I, saying, don't do that. She kept saying, don't do that, but you know, I'm fine, raw. I can do this, you know. But I was feeling it. And so yesterday morning, we're doing the same thing, and my lower back, it, it was starting to really hurt. So I'm thinking, like, Keith, I've got way too much to do. I cannot deal with this. Not now. And uh, Jan was here, and Tracy. So they said, all right, let's pray. They laid hands on me, and I'm telling you, the pain left. I haven't felt it since. And oftentimes we pray, and you know, we extend our faith. We know once we pray, it's done. And we believe God. And we may continue to believe Him while our body is still fighting to come into alignment. But we continue believing Him, knowing that He is faithful. Amen. Amen. Yes. But this was one of those times where the, the uh, manifestation left immediately. So. Give praise to him. Receive in Jesus' name. Because he is here. That's good, right? God is working. We're going to do some more testimonies this afternoon. Um, and, and right now I think we'll go ahead because Jan, I know Jan is re getting ready. So we're going to do one song. And let me just tell you to preempt this song. Get pulled up the war. We're taking back everything the devil has taken from us. Everything. God is restoring everything. This is the time of the resurrected Christ. This is the times of restoration of all things in the body. Amen? Amen. So we're gonna we're gonna do this one song. Yeah. Stand up, we'll do one song, and then we're gonna turn it over to Jan. Jan to deliver her message. It's going to be awesome. Remember that this glory, this conference is called Preparing for the Glory. Preparing for the Glory. And she, her message goes right along with it. Jan Weir. Uh, okay, Jan, come on up. Everybody, let's have a I met Jan a few years ago when Jan came to my house for a conference that I was starting in my living room and uh, we just connected. I love her so much. She goes to Freedom Christian Center and could you introduce your pastor's wife? Yeah. Our pastor, Kelly Franklin, please stand up. <laughs> and so, so I, Stephanie and I were discussing who was going to be speaking and I said, you know who would be great? It's it's uh, it's near Purim, so Jan would be great to do it. So he's like, yeah, that would be great. So Jan, you're going to be great. But you know what I, it's on my heart to do? Is your husband's name is John? Yes. yes. I just I just want us all to agree uh, with the prayer of healing and restoration for John. Yes. So Father, we just lift John up to you. Yes. Lord, your word goes forth. Yes out of your mouth. It doesn't matter that we're not there, but Father, in the Spirit, we lay hands on Him. Yes, oh. We speak healing, wholeness, yes. wealth. We speak prosperity, restoration of His body, yes. His mind, and His soul yes. in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for John. Yes, Touch Him, Lord. Yes. Touch Him right now in the name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. 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 Stand here. Woo! Hopefully my throat's going to hold out there. So good morning, ladies. Good morning. I should say sisters, right? 
It is really wonderful to be here. As I'm sure you are feeling the same way. But I just really honestly count it a privilege and an honor to be able to speak to you today. And you know, I want you to stop and think how privileged you are to be here today. Number one, because we still have the freedom to meet together and worship our great and awesome God. Yeah. <laughs> and number two, because you're here on purpose. And we've already had some fantastic impartation over our lives. Right? This conference will change your life if you let it. it really will. So, before I dive in, one of my expressions, I really want us to go to him, just for one minute. We have praised him with our war song, and now I just want you to lift your voices and exalt him and love him for just one minute, and then I'll open up. Oh, Father. <laughs> We come to you, Lord God. We love you. We exalt you. You are holy. Holy, holy. You are the only one you call holy, Lord God. And you are worthy. Worthy of all praise, of all expectation. You are the Lord and our God. And we love you. We love you, Lord. And Father, we know that you are here with us. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, is right here in this room. We thank you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord God, that you open everyone's heart, Lord, their mind, their soul, to all that you have for them, because I know you've given me a message. And I just pray for your anointing to be on these words that would take it straight to their heart. So we just thank you, Lord. We rejoice in you. Thank you, Lord. I guess I'll try holding this thing. I'm, I'm not real good with microphones, so I might cheat and put it in that. <laughs> I'll try this. So, as um, Allison actually said, we have been celebrating Purim, which started Wednesday night, and actually continued in some areas till Friday. And um, so it's really very fitting that we should look in on Esther and talk a little bit about Esther. And who was this Esther? And why did God choose her? She was an orphan, a young Jewish girl. And she became a remarkable, courageous woman that risked her life and delivered the Jewish people from annihilation. Yes. So what does Esther have to say to us? We're going to find out. <clears throat> but let me just tell you the direction we will take. We will see how we, Esther responded to the circumstances of her life the crucial decision in her life, and the outcome. And then we're going to see our moment in time and delve into the glory and how we can pre prepare ourselves to carry that glory. And I believe you know the story of Esther. Am I right? Most people here would know the story of Esther. So I will only do an overview and set the background. And then we will bring out the points that highlight our purposes for this conference. So Esther was an orphan, brought up by her cousin, actually, Mordecai, who acted as her father. 
So she, you can tell from the story that she deeply respected and loved Mordecai, and she obeyed him. And the book of Esther opens up with King Ahasuerus dethroning the queen, Vashti. Remember that? So his wise counselors suggested he gather all the beautiful virgins from the expanse of the empire to his harem. And the plan was he would spend a night with each of them and decide who would be his next queen. How would you like to be one of those? Never mind. I'm going to stick to the next story. <clears throat> Esther was among the candidates, and I really wish we had time to go into the depth of her character. But we know the Holy Spirit was developing her for her position, right? I mean, what did she do for that one year of beauty preparations? You know, she was godly. I know she was seeking the Lord and saying, what's my future going to hold? <laughs> it all depended on a capricious decision of a king, right? No, God was That's in right. control, right? So anyway, we know that Esther was chosen to be queen. And the story goes on that the king's right-hand man, Haman, devised a plot to annihilate the Jews, really out of his jealousy toward Mordecai. Esther is called upon to plead with the king to save the Jews. However, it involves the risk of death. So I will leave you hanging until we develop the end of the story. <laughs> As if you don't know. <laughs> so we're going to jump right in. And let's look at Esther as she is confronted with a political situation that she was born to intercept. She stands at the crossroads. One direction, fear, will take her to anonymity, possible death, and annihilation of the Jews. The other direction, faith, will take her into great risk of life potential deliverance and salvation of her people. So we're going to read, I've got an old-fashioned Bible. <laughs> I have to get it out here. But we're going to read chapter, chapter 4, 5 through 16. If you have a Bible or a device, you might want to look at it. Chapter 4, starting at verse 5. Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. Because Mordecai was out there in ashes and sackcloth lamenting, the annihilation of the Jews he had just found out. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go in to the king to make her supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. All the king's servants, oh, and Esther, 
I read that, right? Spoke to Hatha and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law. Put all to death. Except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. One of our favorites. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Very stirring. <laughs> Mordecai's question rings in our ears today, right? Yeah. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is Esther's moment. It's that pivotal point in her history that is crucial and will affect all of human history. Sisters, dare I say that we are at this point in time? We are at a point in time we've never seen before. And actually, I'm not going to elaborate on that. But I am going to say that you have a pivotal role to play designed by the Lord Jesus Christ for you at this time. And only you can fulfill it. That's right. You have to believe that. You have to know that you're so loved by your Father. And He created you special. You know everybody has different voice patterns, different fingerprints. And this is not in my notes. But I just feel to impress you that this is not just a good church saying. This is the truth. You're all individually wonderfully made and loved by him and we all have a role to play and it may not be as dramatic as esther's decision but who knows in the eyes of the lord your decision may be just as important We never know how we touch people. I believe in this new era, we will have to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in situations that will cost us. Yes. yes. That's right. And you know, it will change history. Your history 
and those around you. And who knows how far-reaching. You can think of the stories and the testimonies, and I'm not going to go there, but there are so many. Like one person giving the word of God to someone and they get saved, and then they change their whole country. What if that one person hadn't opened up their mouth? What if Grayson hadn't obeyed the Lord last night? Who knows what his friend will become? You know, go through. Esther had a faith that was woven into the fabric of her being. She was educated in the Torah and the scriptures. She knew the word of God, and she knew God. But she was also human. I'm sure she had a little time, but maybe only hours before her reply. And Mordecai's words weighed heavily upon her. She realized she would not be safe in the palace, that they would discover her background, that she was a Jewess, and then she would perish, and her father's house would perish. Under this pressure, did she rehearse all the stories she'd been taught of Moses, and Deborah, and David, and all the miracles that happened in the word of God, all that God did for his people? I'm sure she did. But even so, it still took a decided step of faith and human courage to, to say yes to Mordecai. So we have to ask ourselves, where is our faith? Is it mental? Just a mental ascent? Or does it reside deeply within us where we are willing to risk? You know, just think about it. You walk into a dark room and you flip the switch and you are totally shocked if the light doesn't come on. You subconsciously have faith that that light will come on. Well, you know, do we have that kind of faith in our God? I long for that faith. Anchored in my soul. Even in my subconscious. You know, where I just expect God to do what he says he will do. Amen. Right. Amen. Oh, right. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Another point I want to bring out <clears throat> is in verse 16, she says, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Right. Neither eat or drink for three days, night or day, my mates, and I will fast likewise. Esther turned to the body of believers and trusted that God would hear their corporate prayer. Yes. The Jews knew she was putting her life on the line, and they stood with her and supported her decision to fast and pray. They were one. They believed the God in the hand of God to deliver them. They were totally united in seeking God for their very lives. And I've noticed when the pressure is on, our differences, our complaints, our pettiness within the body of Christ all seem to fade away, yeah. right? Because we are one. That's right. And we're united by the simple truth 
that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. And that alone. Amen. And, and we must declare that truth to the world. Yes. That's what we're here for. We know fasting and prayer work. We are in it. <laughs> right? And the church as a whole is growing in these powerful disciplines. So unity in the body must be a priority in this new era. And ladies, sisters, this conference is key. Amen. That's it right. is a key. Having women from different churches all working together, reaching out to each other, ministering to each other, new relationships being formed, this is a key to opening up that unity in the body. You're it. You're all little flames, and you're going to go out here and set Brevard on fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Esther chose faith. Esther united her people. And the ultimate point is that Esther was willing to give her life. Chapter 416 says, And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther set her face like flint. And you know, Isaiah says of Jesus in chapter 50, verse 7, for the Lord will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I will not be ashamed. And we find that fulfillment of that prophecy in Luke 9, verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Sisters, we must have this conviction in our hearts and souls. The time is upon us. It's not someday in the future we're going to face this. It is now. Already in Canada, Pastors are being jailed for preaching the word of God. Yes. Simply preaching the word of God. But it doesn't line up with our social structure. It offends us. Who's God anyway? We are going to have to stand. Yes. That's right. Lord. Esther chose Faith over fear, courage over cowardice. And this put her in a place where God could intervene and work on her behalf. I'm going to repeat that one. Yeah. Esther chose faith over fear, yes. courage over cowardice. And this put her in a place where God could intervene and work on her behalf. When we risk something, and I was trying to think of the smallest thing we could risk, and what I thought of was our reputation or our position in, for example, maybe even the church, or maybe it's the country club. Or maybe it's the quilters club. But when you stand for what you truly believe and what God is doing in this new era, and you take a hit for it, or as the Bible says, you are reproached for that, the Lord Jesus is going to intervene. He is 
going to stand for you. And you know what? You may not even see it at that particular moment. You may take that slap of a face or whatever. I mean, figuratively speaking, probably, but <laughs> you know what I mean. When sometimes you feel like somebody said something to you that was just like, okay. Suck it up. But you will see the Lord beginning to open doors. After that. And talking about risk, I would encourage you sometime to read the account of Jonathan against the Philistines in 1 Samuel 14. That was great risk. I hope that's true. So Esther said, if I perish, I perish. I believe our verse in our moment of history is Revelation 12:11. And I'm going to start reading at 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Yes. Verse 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know this. <clears throat> so, the, the angelic being is declaring in heaven that Satan has been conquered. He has already been conquered. But he tells us the secret to overcoming the accuser, Satan. And we see three points here. I want to elaborate just a little. Number one, the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> we must get this truth from our brain to our soul. Deep. The sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ is the most powerful force in the total universe. It is the power on this earth. And he has already done the work. You know this. You, you are an elevated group, mature believers. You know that the Lord Jesus has done the work and that he has already met every need and healed every disease, right? And he has our future in his hands. We have to appropriate it. We have to get it from here to living it daily, just like Keith. The, the testimony was wonderful. Stephanie's testimony, just like that. Just in that minute when somebody comes to you and says, oh, oh I'm sick, I hurt. Don't go, oh, I'll pray for you. No, you go, right now, in the name of Jesus, out, aligned with the word of God. I don't need to tell you this stuff, you know. <laughs> But I get, I get excited because we we mature, and I've gone from that stage not so long ago to commanding our bodies in the name of Jesus to line up with truth. Yes, and I have found that personally to be a real secret. Yes. All right. I'll go there, but talk to me later. And as I said, he has our future in his hand. And I'll tell you that if there were ever a time to worry, this would be it. With rising prices and the world in total havoc. But, that's right, but Jesus, right? This is our time to shine. Yes. This is when the world will be on that level 
and we will be on our level right. in him, yes. knowing what his blood has done and that we can appropriate for everybody around us. Number two, the word of your testimony. That means that you confess Jesus as Lord in every circumstance. Don't keep quiet. Amen. And even to yourself, as we were just talking about, you confess Jesus to the devil every day. You know? And to everybody around you. Just, and you know this. You just have to be there for them. Oh. Who was prophesying? Was it Liberty last night? That, or maybe it was Robin. I don't know. So much happened yesterday. But just, we just have to be there. Yes. We have to just be available. Right? right? Yes. Don't see it. People are going to come up to us. Yes. That's right. We're not going to have to work. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to shine. Yes. With his Amen. love and his light. Yes. Amen. Amen. Number three, they did not love their lives to the death. Okay, this is where the road meets the road. (laughs) All I can say is that I believe if you have the fire of God in your soul and you are living as a Christian, obeying the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus, that you will rejoice when the time comes to give your life. The early Christians did. You know, we have ample proof that they sang as they walked into the lion's den. Right? They knew it. They knew who he was. They knew they were going to go meet him. You know? Heaven has to be more real than this one. That's right. Yes. So set your face like a flint that you will never deny the Lord Jesus. Even by your actions. Don't deny. Okay, so back to Esther and the glorious outcome of the great risk. She did go in to King Ahasuerus. And he did extend the golden scepter to her. (laughs) Okay. And you know the story. She made a banquet for the king and Haman. And then she made she made a second banquet for the king and Haman. But at this one. She exposed Haman and his wicked plot to annihilate the Jews. And the king was very angry, and the servants came and covered Haman's face and carted him off. And Esther chapter 8, 1 and 2 states, On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Mordecai became the most powerful man in the kingdom under the king. And Esther and Mordecai wrote the decree that reversed the curse And the Jews were able to defend themselves on that day. But take a note, they still had to fight. Right. Right. Which we could do a whole other teaching on that one. (laughs) But they were given the ability Mm -hmm. to defend themselves and to fight for their lives. Mm -hmm. But they had to fight. And the Feast of Purim was instituted to celebrate that sorrow was turned to joy, mourning into a holiday, and their lives were saved. I think one of the great lessons of the Book of Esther is reversal. When we line up with God's Word, 
and his ways, and we don't look back. We don't back down. We stand in faith. We risk everything. At that point, God can work reversal. Amen. Haman built gallows to hang Mordecai on, right? But Haman hung on those gallows. <laughs> the Jews were destined for death, but they lived reversal. Can you imagine, have you ever just sat and thought about what if Haman was successful? What if Esther did not rise to the occasion? What if the Jews had been annihilated? That would mean there was no Jesus Christ. So we thank Esther. So just take a moment to let the example of Esther seep into your soul. Yeah. Our good and great Father has given us biblical women who have gone before us, who were steadfast and courageous, no matter their background. And he beckons us our rise into the destiny I have for you. And Esther is our inspiration. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. But we're not done yet. <laughs> Ten minutes? But that's a good place. No, it, that's a good place. Oh, but I haven't even got to the important part. Okay. So I was going to tell you to breathe and stretch, but I think I better go on. Because this is what I really want to talk about. <laughs> Just warming you up with Esther. In ten minutes, I don't know. I'll cut out a lot of scripture, I guess. <clears throat> so, I want to talk about our moment in history. That we're here. So, sisters, I don't care what your background is. And I don't care what your past life was like. Because Jesus doesn't care. Or we could say, he did take care of all of it. Yes. Right? Yes. But I do care about you and opening up your heart to your moment in time. Yes. And that is why we're here. To develop our hearts for the glory. To prepare ourselves for his glory. So we're going to dive in. When you hear the word glory, what do you think of? What's your definition? I had to ask myself this question, and I found that I had a very simplistic view of glory. When I heard the word glory, I thought of a great light, and maybe the presence of God. But it was an eye-opener when I read the dictionary definition from the New Compact Bible Dictionary. To quote, concerning God, it is the display of his divine attribute, attributes and perfections. That stopped me in my tracks. That glory is God's attributes and perfections. I had a sentimental, ooey-gooey type definition of glory to do with his light and his presence. But hear me loud and clear. That is not wrong. That is part of it. But it's just so small. Just too small. The foundation of God's glory, according to the Easton's Bible Dictionary, says the glorious moral attributes and infinite perfections of God. And they give Isaiah 40, verse 5, as a reference. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. And before I would have thought of this as a great light, but now I know it means that the perfection of God's character and attributes, 
such as holiness, love, mercy, righteousness, and truth would be revealed. And actually, if you look at that whole chapter, verse 40, I mean, chapter 40, they're speaking of the Lord Jesus coming as the glory of God. Yes. Isn't that so much more meaningful yes. than a light? Yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to the Strong's Concordance real quick because I'm that kind of person. So the Strong's Concordance definition of the Hebrew, the number is 3519, and the word is kabod. And the root is kabod. But it means weight in a good sense. Weight. And the second definition is splendor or copiousness, which means vast in number and abundant. But when I read that about the weight and things went click, click in my brain, I remembered a song thing that just really grabbed my heart. And the line from it is, my heart can't contain the weight of your name. Yeah. Think about it. My heart can't contain the glory of your name. My heart can't contain the perfections of God. All that is God. Oh, we stretch our hearts to take hold of all that is Him. Okay, the word glory appears 351 times in the New King James Version of the Bible. And you can be glad and rejoice because I'm not going to read all of them. <laughs> But I have got a few definitions. Maybe I'll try to cut out some. Um, I am because okay. Let's let's just take Second Chronicles five thirteen B and fourteen. The background here is dedicating Solomon's temple, and the people were praising the Lord here and the singers were praising and it starts out by saying and praise the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endures forever that the house the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house Amen. this is what we call the Shekinah glory right You've heard that word before? That word does not exist. Shekinah does not exist in the Hebrew Bible. It's actually in the Aramaic translation called the Targum. But Shekinah means the physical manifestation of God's glory, as in a cloud, as in the fire and the cloud that led them through the wilderness. That is the Shekinah. And then Psalm 19, 1, heavens declare the glory of God. This really popped out to me after realizing that the heavens declare the perfections of God. Think of all those billions of stars just shining God's perfections. And you know, I believe that power emanates from holiness. And I believe it's the same for us. As we live morally obedient to the Lord, we have more power Amen. and authority Amen. in our lives. Yes. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we'll go to John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the, His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And you know, that's the fulfillment of that Isaiah 40, verse 5, that we read, that says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Jesus is the moral attributes and perfections of the Father in the flesh. That is glory. Also, John 17, 22, we have to read, right? 
this is the Jesus praying for the disciples. He says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they might be one just as we are one. So that glory of God's attributes and perfections, Jesus gives us by living inside of us. Amen. And what's the purpose? So that we can be one. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings. And when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And if you are reproached, for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blessed, but on your part, he is glorified. So we've got a lot of glory in there, and I think we'll need to hang on to this verse in the future. But you always remember, when people badmouth you because of your stance, for Jesus, that you are blessed, that the spirit of glory is resting on you as the spirit of Christ is upon you. Okay, we've tasted just a little bit of the glory. And now we move on to the important question. How will you prepare for the glory? And this isn't a nebulous, spiritual question. This is a practical everyday life kind of question. Because when the glory of God overtakes us, everything will change. Our mental paradigm will change. The way we think of God and expect Him to work will change. Jesus, our ideas, the way we think of Jesus, who knows, He might have fire in His eyes as He questions your motives. We don't know how he's going to be, right? And our schedules may change. I've talked with people who were in the Belburn at the Lord's Visitation in the 1990s. They were at church six nights a week. And some of you were there, I am sure. I know. And I also heard how glorious it was, and you did not want to be in place else. Like, that's where it was happening. And when that glory falls, it wrecks you, and you absolutely love it. Right? Ah. So in what ways do we need to prepare ourselves? Okay. I'll try to go through this fast. I only have one more page. But I really feel that right now worship is extremely important. Yes. Daily worship in your own prayer closet. Not just bringing your petitions, but getting on your face before Him. And it's my personal conviction that we need to focus on Yahweh as a great and awesome God who created the heavens and the earth. Yes. It's, it's just my thing that I pour over photos from the Hubble telescope <laughs> and wonder, look at all of those stars, knowing my God made those stars. Amen. Nothing is impossible for him. And he loves me. He really loves yes. me and is concerned for me, just as he is for you, every single one of you. He deeply, truly loves. And we come into that when we worship him. 
as we get to know him as a great and awesome God and as Abba, Father, right? Worship Jesus. I love to call him Yeshua, his Hebrew name. Thank him for his great sacrifice. We need more revelation of what he did on the cross. Worship him as the Lamb of God. Read Revelation 4 and 5. Go into that throne room and be with him. Look into his eyes and thank him and love him. And the Holy Spirit in Hebrew is Ruach HaKodesh. I love that. He's the gift of Jesus. He walks with us and lives within us. Really. He really does. So worship him and thank him for being your constant companion, your guide. And learn to live with him moment by moment. Let him lead and you follow. Sometimes I get that backwards. I plan my day and I get all set and I go, oh, could you bless this? Could you help me? we got to switch that. Yes, yes. So when your heart longs for your Lord more than the distractions of this earth, we are then coming into preparedness. And I'm not there yet, but I've seen glimpses and I've tasted and I'm going for it. Woo! All the way. How much time do I have? <laughs> Are you close? Um, a little bit. I'll, I'll just name names. The next, well, I'm going to do this a little bit because I think it's really important. The fear of the Lord is a necessary part of our relationship with Him that I think we're lacking in. And I'll just say Exodus 20. 18 through 20. And I'm not going to read it, but it's when they stood at that mountain. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So he's telling them not to fear in a bad way, but to fear. Fear God. And um, I think we need, there's a proper place for the fear of God, that reverence and awe. And we worship Him with that attitude that He is so awesome. And it's so incredible that He loves us and has mercy and grace on us. And I will tell you something I believe to be true that you cannot love him at a real depth without understanding what it is to fear his name. That's right, man. And I'm just getting my feet wet in that too. To tell you the truth. And then I have knowing the word, so I won't go into depth. Um, the verse I have is 119.11 and then verse 16. But I will say, the knowledge of the word must go from the mental to the soul, even into your subconscious, where it will govern not only your thinking patterns, but your unplanned responses to things. We need to know our God and his ways. And everything Jesus did was fulfillment of the original covenant and the Father's design for Adam. And then we need to walk in humility. And that leads to forgiveness, which we did work in last night. So the main point I had about forgiveness, we've been taught a lot about it. But do we ask the Holy Spirit daily to show us if we've offended someone? Or have we been offended, even by service people? And you know how you get these little attitudes, like I did last week in Lowe's. Like, oh, it's going to treat me like that. 
you know? But I got convicted, and I had to repent and bless the God. That's what we have to do daily. We cannot let those little, and, and we think they're nothing. Oh, well. And we go tell our friends, oh, they were so mean to me. You know, I'm sorry that's what stagnates our soul. We cannot let that kind of stuff. And that's what it does. And that leads into cleansing. Just to honor the conviction of the Holy Spirit, to be obedient, to walk without compromise and in His purity. You know, and He will guide us daily. And then we will love one another. And that means putting others before ourselves, right? Extending grace, even if they don't deserve it. Because Jesus says to us, let me see my glory in you. Romans 12, 9 and 10 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. And that brings us to my last point on the critical list of points. And that is unity. And again, I'm just going to read you John 17, 22. Because Jesus is talking to the Father and he says, And the glory you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Yes. So the purpose of the glory of God in us is to unify the body of Christ so we move and act like Jesus. We are his body yes. and we do the work that he did. We will magnify Jesus beyond our differences. I think Robin was speaking of that yesterday. Yes. really yes. hit me. So these are just a few of the areas that I believe Jesus is highlighting. Worship, fear of the Lord, the word, humility, forgiveness, cleansing, love, and unity. Yes. We are preparing our hearts. You're here today for that reason. You might say we are buying oil. Oh, yes. Because we want to be among the five virgins of Matthew 25 yes. that enters in with the bridegroom. So sisters, I see us in this way. That we will delve into the fear of the Lord, worshiping Him in holiness. We will eat, breathe, and know the word of God. We will walk in humility and forgiveness, asking the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin daily. We will love one another and unify the body. And we will do his works of service that we were created for, as Ephesians 2.10 tells us. We are all growing together. So one last word, <laughs> expect things to be different, expect change, expect to put the flesh under your feet and reach for heaven, amen? We will know the glory and we will be prepared. Okay, let me just pray for you really quick, because I want to see it. So, uh, Father, we come to you in the name of Yeshua. Savior, Lord God. And we give this to you. We give our hearts and souls to you. We surrender before you right now today. Lord, and we ask you to seal this word to our minds, our hearts, our souls, the depths of our being, and that, Lord, you would bring it up when you need to into our conscious mind and convict us of the way we walk with you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you that we can meet together. We thank you for every woman here that's here on purpose, for purpose. Thank you. Amen.
she's a teacher.